So, tonight's topic is emotional intelligence. What the heck is that? What is he on about? What is em- Josh, what is emotional intelligence? Well, I'll answer that question. Uh, emotional intelligence is the ability to identify, hold, and then express to other people in a useful way uh, an emotional state that we're in. So this process of knowing what we're experiencing, being able to hold it and then be able to express it all together not only creates emotional, what's called emotional intelligence, it's also how we regulate our emotions so that we can connect with people. When we connect simply by words, telling stories, relating events through uh, conjecture, talking about movies we like, uh, all that language-based stuff, it's basically my left hemisphere connecting with your left hemisphere. It's only half of the job. But when I can express largely through not just words but through non-verbal signals, an emotional state and have it received by you, mirrored back in your expressions, that's my right hemisphere talking to your right hemisphere. And that, when both our words and our emotions connect, that is truly what pre- presents in the human experience the deepest feeling of bonding and intersubjectivity and mutuality and support. When I know that you are there and can understand not just the things I tell you, but you can receive my emotional activations and uh, create with me a safe container that I can feel and express, not just again in words, but through facial gestures, body gestures, the tone of my voice, all the different ways I communicate, if you can be with me, hear that, and and not interrupt, not pull away, not try to solve and fix me and tell me what to do, but actually just create a, a safe space, then I am rewarded with the true intimate bonding that we human beings seek in our life is the deepest expression of... Uh, the feeling of being in the world with other people. Feeling secure comes from our connection. So, um, emotions come in different flavors and different types. The type that I'm going to be talking the most about is what's known as biologically basic emotions, and those are the universal survival-based emotions that all human beings have, transculturally, transhistorically. Um, and there are different lists of how many basic emotions we have. Ekman said we had about six. Some Scottish uh, evolutionary biologists say we have four. So I'm going to say five. Fuck it. Uh, <laughs> Basic are anger, fear, sadness, happiness, and disgust. Every list generally has those. Some people don't put in disgust, but most do. Um, And these uh, emotions serve two functions. As I said, one function is to, they are... In essence, signals are forms of communication that help me bond with you. When I am born, the first three years of my life, I do not connect to you, mommy, daddy. I don't connect to them via language. I send verbal signals indicating my state of being. So I might cry, I might smile, I might... Uh, signal disgust, I might signal any a, a variety of states. And through these emotional activations, if you maintain awareness of me, then I feel safe. 
infants more than they need food, more than they need warmth, more than they need anything else, they are set up to seek attunement, having somebody take them in and maintain them in awareness. That's what provides us with our sense of we will survive. Because as of, obviously as an, of an infant, we are vulnerable. We don't survive unless there is a larger being taking care of us. And the way we know we are going to be taken care of is when somebody simply takes us in, provides attention. So very often in life, when people come to us and they express their emotions, we feel it's kind of our duty to tell them everything's going to be okay or tell them what to do or make them feel better. And in fact, really, the deepest thing that human beings seek when they share an emotion with another human being is simply a safe space where they can express what they're experiencing. They don't need solutions. They don't need somebody to tell them what to do or to solve it for them. They just need somebody to create that safe space where they feel seen. Emotions are also survival impulses when they're basic emotions. So anger pushes me to fight. Fear pushes me, urges me, primes me to run. How does it do that? Fear creates a release of cortisol, adrenaline, sends blood to my legs, starts my heart pumping. It creates all the physical sensations that I will go through when I feel an impulse to run or flee. Fear, uh, anger is similar, but it will send more of the blood to my arms, uh, my jaw will lock, my shoulders will clench, and I might even release some endorphins because I expect maybe to take some blows. I don't fight particularly well. So, uh, I punch like that. <laughs> so, uh, I remember when I used to get drunk. Me and my friends, we were all lame and we invariably get into fights at the end of the night. And we just, like, <laughs> Nobody would injure anybody. Uh, so our emotions are priming us to take actions. Uh, Survival-based. Disgust is an impulse to expel. Happiness is interesting. It's the only basic emotion that doesn't push us in a single direction. It is what Barbara Fredrickson wonderful psychologist calls a broadening emotion that allows us to have multiple responses. So if you say something that makes me feel uh, connected, appreciated, loved, then the happiness I feel is a broadening emotion. It allows me to choose a, from a multiple different uh, set of responses. I can dance, a little happy dance. I can I can smile, I can tell you something back that's appreciative. So many evolutionary psychologists uh, are noted for saying that when we are in negative survival emotions, we don't have free will because we are basically pushed in a single action. But when we actually experience a positive emotion, we actually have some free will restored because we can choose how to respond to life. So, um, we get to know our emotions through the interactions with our caretakers, our parents. Up until these early experiences with a caretaker, um, when we first experience fear or anger, frustration, uh, disgust, they're all activations largely in the body and energy levels in the mind. But we don't really know what they are and we don't know if we're okay. And so we run to a caretaker to have a caretaker essentially say, oh, you're scared, you're upset, you're frightened, you're uh, vulnerable. So the, what's happening there is the emotion is being identified for us. And then by 
taking us and creating a safe space, we are presented with a what's called a safe container to hold the emotion. And then in this exchange, the emotion becomes regulated. The mother, if we're frightened, might give a little fr uh, frightened face and then smile. And so the mother or the caretaker is regulating our emotional state to uh, a level where we can still have an emotion, but uh, it's not overwhelming. And throughout the course of our lives, we seek our friends to do the same. The reason why people fall apart, become dysregulated, become essentially insane in very short periods of solitary confinement is simply due to the lack of emotion regulation. Human beings do not regulate emotions in isolation. We can hold an emotion in isolation in meditation. We can go on a spiritual retreat for a week and we can feel an emotion, but eventually the emotions are only processed and regulated when we find someone who's safe and we share it. So simply, uh, a lot of people come to Dharma punks. I made a little come gesture. Come to Dharma punks. <laughs> That's kind of creepy. Uh, so people often, uh, after depressing or dispiriting interpersonal experiences, breakups, uh, har you know, horrible interpersonal events in life, come to spiritual centers hoping that, hoping that meditation will do all the work. <coughs> and guess what? All the work we do in meditation only gives us the tools of holding our emotional activations. But the final step is seeing that person to your right or left or finding those secure people that you can express the feeling. And through that exchange, your emotions become uh, regulated. If I talk to you and express my a sad experience, if you begin to get bored, I know that I have to modulate up the expressions on my face, the sadness in my voice. It's all unconscious, but I'll do something to keep your attention. But if it's too much and you start to feel crowded by my expressions, and you start to pull back, then I, I will hopefully down-regulate the emotional expression. And it's through these connections that I learn how to be with and process my feelings and feel secure in the world. So we need skillful people who can be with us through this process. Now there are other emotions that are complex emotions, such as love, bitterness, melancholy, pride, guilt. And these emotions, when they're studied in fMRI scans, they use more of the brain than just the mid-brain mid and the, a little bit of the right hemisphere. They use a lot of the language centers as well. So we can regulate those experiences more through language by talking about depression and therapy or melancholy. You might be able to get some... Um, uh, feeling of security. But when it comes to your basic fears, your basic sadness, the core emotions of your life, the, most, the times when you feel the most vulnerable, what you most need is somebody to create a safe container to help you hold those activations. So what happens if the emotions that we feel are not well recognized by caretakers? Yes, this does happen. My parents were very good with uh, verbally expressed emotions. They were very good with holding, they loved humor, they loved, they could tolerate even sadness. My mom was uh, depressed for much of her life and didn't uh, seem to mind it that much. <laughs> but uh, uh, my dad was... Uh, a poor model of anger. He didn't show how to hold anger and express it. When he got angry, he basically, it turned very quickly into rage or violence. And so I grew up without the ability to largely recognize when I was angry 
or learn how to safely hold it or express it in a way that was um, uh, particularly useful. When caretakers fail to show us how to, or when there's one emotion that they don't tolerate, identify, and hold very well, what tends to happen is we will seek other means to regulate those and hold those activations. One, because they feel foreign. There are energies in the body that nobody has told us how to be with. So when I would feel frustrated, I wouldn't know how, when I was young, when I was 12 or 13, I wouldn't know how to be with it. It felt too unsafe. It felt like an energy that was going to consume me. So I would seek the false regulation of drugs and alcohol for my, uh, my anger. And I learned very quickly that whenever my dad would be abusive or unsafe, to, I kept stashes of drugs and alcohol, and I just repaired in my room and regulate the emotional way that way. Of course, it doesn't really work. Uh, it's a form of repression. The actual emotional state isn't in any way meaningfully uh, regulated by drugs. It's simply essentially replaced or smothered. And it remains, and what happens is I would then take out my anger that was suppressed in jolts of rage that would come out largely against myself. Uh, so the only way, again, to regulate these emotions is through the secure interpersonal connection that's based on honesty, openness. Now, if there, there are other ways people can uh, learn to try to deal with emotions that have not been particularly well tolerated. One way is to mask emotions, what uh, Anna Freud called reaction formation, which is to change an emotion that you feel unsafe with to an emotion that you feel safe with. I, uh, uh, I've worked with many people who will, when they're talking about very sad things, will laugh nervously while they talk about an abandoning experience. It's like an impulsive laugh, and it says, it's okay, I'm, you know, I'm allowed to talk about this, right? Because they don't know how to hold their sadness, or they don't know how to hold their anger. So they will replace these emotions. I didn't particularly, uh, of course, feel comfortable with anger, so when somebody would mistreat me, and then they would come to apologize... I would immediately find myself saying, it's all right, to try to mask any allowance of myself to express honest disappointment in the way that they behave, because I didn't know how to regulate it to a degree that would be tolerable, and I would be frightened that if I let any of my anger show, it would be all-consuming. It took many years of, well, decades <laughs> of solid therapy to learn how to express my anger without it, you know, either minimizing it or allowing it to just explode in unregulated bouts of rage. So, um, very often people who haven't learned how to regulate emotions or there's emotions they feel uncomfortable with will very quickly switch an unsafe to a safer activated state. We might avoid the people that, or the situations that trigger feelings of fear rather than learn how to be with and express fear. And another strategy that people use to, to keep emotions hidden is to basically uh, keep ourselves disembodied, to live entirely in the sort of visual realm of laptops, screens, phones, computers, Facebook, so that we don't have to stop and actually feel the body because the body is where all of these unregulated emotional states present themselves. The left hemisphere, the language center, comes through words. The right hemisphere of the emotional activation speaks to us largely through the somatic, the kinesthetic, the body. That's because when we were children in the first three years, we used emotions 
to communicate, we didn't communicate through language, we communicated through body gestures, facial expressions, and these emotional states continue to speak to us through the body, which is why it's so powerful sometimes to stop and try to meditate because you're actually reconnecting with a realm of emotions that might be, have been waiting there for a while saying, I'm here, hello, it's me, your unprocessed, well, it probably doesn't speak to you, but your unprocessed grief. So, <clears throat> if we keep uh, these activations, these emotions at bay long enough, what they will do is piggyback into our day-to-day lives. For instance, I was talking with somebody recently, uh, what did they tell me? It was a classic example of... Uh, of a piggybacking. Well, I'll use the general one I use. Uh, people who haven't processed their sadness over abandonments, generally what will happen is if they get into a relationship, no matter how short it is, if the person dumps them, breaks up with them, I don't know what term you guys are using now. <laughs> I shouldn't gender it. Anyway, what people are using now. Uh, but uh, if you get when people get broken up with, they can fall apart, even if it's a two-week-long relationship. Why? Well, it's not really the present relationship. It's the uh, suppressed, repressed, uh, unregulated feelings of sadness that we haven't (coughs) attended to that come welling up. Finally, they have an excuse to be seen, to be felt. And so we can be very distraught by events. People can go through situations at work where somebody's being very um, abusive or mistreating, and even though we're safe now as adults, we can feel like we can't tell them, hey, that's enough. You're, you're, you're crossing a line here. And it's because the emotions that we have never learned how to be with and process they don't know that we're now adults that can take care of ourselves. They've been kept out of view. So the Buddha had very, very similar constructs as these. He called them anusayas. And he said, waiting just beneath the level of our conscious lives, there are these anusayas, these latent energies, some of which anger, self-doubt, pride, seeking, craving pleasure, fear, death. We have these underlying energies and they wait for anything that we contact as a reason to rush up. And he said they express themselves as what he calls Vedana or feelings in the body. So it's very, it's almost an identical scheme of how emotions speak to us. So what I'd like to present you is a way of creating a safe container to recognize, identify, and be with emotions as they present themselves, so that when you have something that feels like an overwhelming experience, you won't feel compelled to suppress it or push it away, or B, act out on it. Sometimes if we don't know how to regulate our anger, we might explode, or if we don't know how to regulate fear, we might run away from encounters that we could easily survive. So I want to give you a tool that will help you be with these emotional states and begin the processing, which will, of course, be completed when you share them with others. So this is going to be a meditation process. Um, A couple words before I go, I lead it. Um, When you're working with painful emotions, it's very important to learn how to, or give yourself permission to pull back if an emotion becomes too strong. So if you're connecting with something that feels really sad or really (coughs) painful, then if it if it just feels too much for your body to hold, then you could bring in awareness of the sounds around you. 
you could add in a uh, image in your mind of someone who is creates a feeling of safety. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a practice of I'm going to suggest that you hold in your uh, visual field of your imagination a triggering event from your life, something that brings up an emotional experience. Then we're going to note it so we'll learn how these emotions express themselves to us in the body. And then what we're going to do is maintain awareness with it without pushing it away or acting out on it. And finally, we're going to do a little bit of regulating by nurturing the emotion by assuring it will be okay. Giving it like the kind of reassuring, soothing uh, thoughts or feelings we're going to send to it that we would hope somebody who cares about us would. So find a really comfortable seated position. Close in the eyes and take a nice full breath. Breathing out and just relaxing the body. Another nice full breath. And then finally a third. Really softening with the out breath. So what I'd like you to do is bring to mind not a story or a whole narrative, but an image of someone or an event where you felt either mistreated or unsafe or disappointed. Now, if it's a traumatic experience, I prefer you to use something that's not too wounding. So a, a violent experience, let's not work with that. That's better regulated entirely with someone else. So choose something that you believe you can hold. It could be somebody who didn't appreciate you or you're constantly finding doesn't hear what you're trying to say or a conversation that you're wanting to avoid because it might be conflictual. Perhaps an ex interpersonal experience that was just disappointing. And just hold the image <laughs> and just ask an, yourself an open-ended question, not too detailed, something along the lines of how does it feel to be talked to in such a harsh way? How does it feel to be not seen? How does it feel to be abandoned or rejected? How does it feel for somebody to try to shame me? How does it feel to not be seen or cared for? And I like to use very wet language because we're trying to, we're inviting an emotion to appear. And then see if you can find in the body, the front of the body, where most core emotions are expressed the stomach, the chest, the throat, the shoulders, the face. See if you can just notice even a slight contraction of muscles or a wave of energy, a shifting of sensations. If nothing appears, no worries. Just try a different image or a different question. And even if nothing appears, you can just note this process and do it when you feel more activated. Perhaps a 
sad experience might create a sense of just heaviness in the body and the mind might feel a little more closed and heavy. And just allow the state to be there. This is creating a safe container. We're not getting rid of it. We're showing ourselves that we can be with each activation as it arises without needing to suppress it or act it out. It's a third solution, being with. So holding the anger, the sadness, the grief, shame, whatever. And lastly, see if we can cultivate a very caring, nurturing, simple, reassuring phrase that we can repeat and send to it. It's less the words than the feeling. If it's all right, I'll take care of you. Even if I'm abandoned, I'll take care of you. Even if I'm not loved by this person, I'll take care of you. Even if I don't get what I want in this situation, I'll take care of you. And so let go of the image. And then beginning to bring in other sensations, the sounds of the room, (coughs) other sensations in the body. And just allowing whatever has presented itself to be there, but amongst all the other sensations that are available. So I hope tonight's talk was in some way worthwhile, beneficial. I thank you for listening. Now we have time for questions. If you do use this time to leave, if you can help support by donating. And I'm going to turn off this stuff.